welcome in for some Nittany Game Week web exclusive content. Everybody's favorite time is to come and join some web exclusive stuff. And we just kind of shoot the bull a little bit, talk about some topics, and we love our viewers and we love their questions. And this is the time that we get to feature some of them. Yep. So we got a couple that we want to fire at you. Uh, Jay, take the first one. This is from a Twitter question. Uh, wanted to know who are our top four Penn State defenders of all yeah, time? Because there's only been four or five, right? I have not go well. It yeah. started with a discussion about who's on the Mount Rushmore of defenders at Penn yeah. State and yeah. morphed into this. Yes. <laughs> I know too many of them that if I don't say them, and you're in the same and boat. Too many of them we, know my phone number, yeah, too, don't, and uh, where I live. And as I say, your address. So we're not going to start our I'm car yes. <laughs> because that's how serious they take this. <laughs> but, but it is tough. It is tough to compare across generations. But it's a good question. It's a great question. A great and question. one defense I want to highlight. Let's take a look at the first answer. Our first full screen: the 1947 Penn State defense. Okay. Six shutouts in ten games, four points per game, and they still hold the NCAA records for fewest yards allowed in the game. This is total offense. Minus 47. I'm glad I, I'm glad I missed that one. Uh, minus 107 yards rushing, and they did manage 60 yards passing. For the season, they only gave up 17 yards per game. That's 170 wow. yards for the year. <laughs> and only .64 yards Per and you thought you were a good defensive coordinator. <laughs> yeah, this huh? is. Huh? And, the, and the, they were 9 0 and 1, and the team they tied was Doak Walker's SMU. And Ed Checkeye missed the extra point. And for, mm. the, to, for the rest of his life, that's all he ever heard about. Oh, I'm sure. And I'm sure. God rest his soul. Sorry, this, Ed, to bring that up. This is a great question. And I also think let's take hey, some of those guys could probably make our top defensive list of players. Yes. So let's take a look at some guys, because if you look at discussions, it generally starts around 1998 or 9 and goes on. And they talk about guys like LeVar, who certainly... Yeah, I mean, and Paul think about guys who are older, it's 25 years of time to talk about. That's a lot no, of time to discuss. No question. So you're bringing up the times <laughs> previous to that quarter yeah, century. Now, I was not alive here. I was not alive here. I was alive there. That's Tom was alive. alive. Like, no. Tom, I was Tom alive had season tickets here. for the 47 <laughs> I was alive here. But let me say this about that group, Jake. I think that I could get some pretty good numbers with that group. Well, Rosie Greer... In 1952, was 6'5", 284. Wow. Was a big man. And, you know, there's a guy that was an All-American in track, in javelin, shot put, and discus, as well as playing defensive tackle. Dave Robinson and, and Jack Ham. And, by the way, Rosie Greer was the guy who subdued Sirhan Sirhan after Robert F. Kennedy was shot. So very interesting life after. Phenomenal after, guy. And a part of the foursome, fearsome foursome in L, the L.A. Rams with Merlin Olsen and Deacon Jones and that group. But Dave Robinson and Jack Ham. The only two Penn State guys in the College Football Hall of Fame and NFL Hall of Fame, so certainly they're in that discussion. Mike Reed, Sports Illustrated's all-century team, so certainly he's in that discussion. Bruce Clark, Shane Conlon. I mean, how do you keep any of these guys off that list? Yeah. You can't make a top four. But here's what's interesting. What about uh, grew up 45 miles from Penn State? 80 miles from Penn State, pretty close to Penn State yeah. territory. Yeah, yes, Bruce Clark, <laughs> Newcastle. Newcastle. Fruitsburg, New York, New Jersey. Uh, high, went to high school in Jersey and Jersey, so yeah. Yeah, and that's the cool part is a lot of these guys, RPA guys, that went on to star in Happy Valley. So a long-winded way so to we say. So ducked, we ducked your question. Yeah, long-winded yeah, way to say it's really difficult. But, but it was I, fun. But I like your approach to it. Like we said, it's pre the last 25 years because I think the, the last 25 years are pretty well documented as to the guys that have stood out and the ones, you know, you can look at who was the NFL first-round draft picks, who was All-Americans, that, that type of stuff. So it was, you know, interesting that you brought that up. So. That group could play in any age, though. Yeah. Yes, of any, course. Any era. And that's the, I mean, that's always the argument. If they mm -hmm. dominated then, they would do the things that they, you know, to yep. dominate in a current yep. setting as well. So, so okay. So Ed Roshak we says, I heard your comments in Nittany Game Week about Southern teams coming north to play. Was it really hard to schedule them? I only recall Alabama, Kentucky, and now Auburn in Beaver Stadium. So, yes, it was. Joe used to talk about one of the things he had great respect for Coach Brian in Alabama was Penn State had called Tennessee and Georgia and Florida, all these SEC teams to do a home-and-home. -home. Nobody would do it. Bryant signed a ten, did for 10 years. So let's take a look at the home and home. 10 years straight, Penn State and wow. Alabama played, and then 10-11. 10, 
Kentucky did it for four years. Now, these are the current SEC teams, not back then. Right. A&M for two years, Missouri for two years, and Vanderbilt. This is going back to 1950 or 1960-ish. Uh, obviously, I got that wrong. Yeah. Um, but anyway, the <laughs> Southern point team. That was the point. Was yeah, the Southern point team. Not many games, not many teams. And Bryant and, and Joe actually at one point were talking about adding another game in the Meadowlands because they both understood how important that rivalry was. And the 2010 and 11 were scheduled for 2004 and 5. Yeah. And Alabama was on probation, and Mal Moore, the AD, asked if we could move it back. I wish we had played them in 5 instead of 10 11. Would have been different. Yeah. But, yep. But, boys, yep. The, point so, to, the answer to the question is yes. It's, it's very, very tough. difficult to get yep. teams from the South to come up yep. North, which is part of the reason why it's fascinating what's going to happen with the 12 team playoff is you're going to force them. They're not going to yep. have a choice if they have to come North to Beaver Stadium, uh, as, you know, a la Clemson was scheduled, yep. you know, once we had the one to, you know, to potentially come to Beaver yep. Stadium until things shifted the last couple of weeks yeah. of, the, of the rankings. We want to see week. Tennessee and Camp Randall when it's snowing sideways, you know, <laughs> or LSU. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we're going, I mean, it, it's just going to, some cool matchups, even yeah. like going to Neyland. I mean, used to work yeah. in, in Knoxville, and I, I can't imagine those two schools doing a home-to-home. It would yeah. be awesome. So, okay, moving on. Transfer Mike from portal Pittsburgh. opened up this week. How much can teams really make a jump by getting a bunch of guys from the transfer portal? How much does NIL money come into play? <laughs> Where do you start with that? Free agency <laughs> year-round. Yes. Okay, yes. So, in essence, that's huge, the transfer portal. We were discussing this. If I'm in the transfer portal myself, you know what I'm looking for? I'm looking for offensive and defensive linemen. Because they're you go to recruit in high school, how is he gonna get to be two eighty-five, two ninety? How big you already know that now. Yeah. So that's where I'm looking in that portal is for bigger people myself. Yeah, and I think I think the thing about it is this is you know, Mel Tucker went to Michigan State, brought in a boatload of transfers. They had a great season. Well, this year, they kind of fell off. I think it, it it's a, might be a good one-year strategy, but I think you've got to continually, just like the great baseball teams, you've got to build the base of your team with guys you recruit, guys develop, guy knows, guys that know what your program is about and what the routine is. And then, yeah, you can augment it here and there, but I don't think it becomes that. Now, how much does NIL money come into play? I don't think we know the date on that yet. I think we'll find out over a year or two. And I think even with this, we'll find out over time. When you look at how many teams brought guys in, I think it's going to take a while to get that all figured out. But it is, it's real, it's here, whether we like it or we not. We don't have a lot of data points on the NIL yet, but we certainly have heard figures being thrown yeah. around. And you mentioned free agency all through the season. So for our viewers that are tuning in, um, the people that jump in first are probably just like free agency in other sports probably going to get some of the sweeter deals at the front end of it if you see somebody that's out there that you can fill the need with with some of the NIL money. I heard a good line the guy was talking about the other day, and he said it's almost like this is kind of like putty, you know, because you'll go and you'll go, oh, okay, I can put something here. I can get a guy from here. You can help yourself a little bit in certain spots. I don't think you can make a living on it. Like you said, you'll have one great year, then the next year the continuity has gone. I think you have to get your guys. And every once in a while, there's that one person that he'll fit in great with our team. Yeah. And I think the money part, how sustainable is it? Yeah. Because if you keep going back to your donor base and saying, well, we spent $3 million last year on the transfer portal, and we want to keep some of those guys, and we got to spend X. So it's, it's, it's all going to sort itself out. And it's out. always the viewpoint that you take on something. How, are you going to look at it in a positive light, a negative light? Why is the guy in the transfer portal? Is it because the other team didn't want him? No. Maybe they just didn't make the right decision that was right for them and their family to, to start with. It certainly worked out for Chop Robinson, a guy that went to Maryland, yeah. and he ended up saying, you know what, I'm really glad I made the decision to go to Penn State. I wouldn't change that decision. It's really worked out for me, yeah. not just playing time-wise or just not just playing, but but personally, and it's really about finding that right fit. I transferred after two years, two and a half years of college to go to another school, you know, as a former athlete, stopped playing and then went to another school because I wanted to take other classes. This is your college years. I have two kids that are making those decisions, yep. whether they want to stay at the current school or go to another school that has nothing to do with athletics. So there's, you, guys, you guys lived it, right, yeah. forever. That's just that point in a lot of young pe people's lives 
where they're trying to decide what they want to do and where they want to go. Enter football into the equation, enter money into the equation, coaches moving into the equation, and all that yeah. comes into it. Your coach left the guy that recruited you, and yeah. it also could be, as you said, for maybe for academic reasons. You know, you'd want to go into a different area of academic studies, and maybe this place has something yeah. better for you yeah. academically. It's not always athletically all the time. Well, well the convergence <laughs> of all the things with the extra COVID years makes us even more tricky. Yeah. Because guys can take a six year and it jams up, you know, with all these guys moving, it jams up who you recruit in high school. Yeah. So guys sometimes are opting to take the older guys and that's cutting down the number of guys. So it's going to take some time between COVID, the transfer portal, and NIL. It's going to take some time for this to all filter out and everybody to get to any type of normalcy. I think the one thing we can encapsulate it with is Boy, times have changed. <laughs> it is definitely very, very different. Coach Prime coming into Colorado and said, look, fellas, I brought, I'm bringing my own luggage. You know, you yeah. want to stay, you're going to have to do some certain things, and things have certainly rapidly changed. All right, we got a couple more things that, you know, i got a couple questions for you yeah. we want to fire at you, and we'll move through them a little bit quicker. There's a lot of talk about the transfer portal and the NIL money, as evidenced by the last question. Talk specifically about Penn State's INL initiatives and the success with Honor Collective that Pat Kraft and Penn State coaches across the board are endorsing. I think the big thing is that the athletic department is working, you know, with Success with Honor to try and create opportunities for students in all sports. So far, uh, Success with Honor specifically has helped athletes in 28 of 31 sports. So we're, we're, it's broad-based, which I think you have to do to be fair to everybody involved and, and to do this thing the right way, the Penn State way. One of the things that we hear all the time is why, you know, why should these athletes get these things? Well, the overwhelming majority of, of these athletes are not on full scholarship. Um, they're paying their way. So these things are, uh, they're helping them be part of Penn State. They're essentially paying to play a sport at Penn State. This helps lessen that burden for the families. So I think it's important. And the, the, the university has gotten behind this, gotten very aggressive, and they've been really pushing this thing to try and get this done the right way and create a model that we makes Penn State a national leader, which is our tradition. Yep. And you've been behind it for a while now. Yep. You guys saw it coming, your group and all that. Yep. So uh, moving, moving in that direction. All right. Many fans have the impression that NIL is only about giving money to football and basketball. You touched on the other sports yep. with that. It goes deeper than that just for the money for those high-profile student athletes. It also touches on all some of the other athletes, not just the extra sports, but the extra athletes within those sports. Yeah. It's not just one volleyball player or two volleyball players. You're, you're stretching it out to, to the, give opportunities to the entire team. Well, when you look at it, there's 850 athletes at Penn State. Roughly 125 of them are on full scholarships. That means the other 725 are on no money, quarter scholarships, half scholarships, and we, we saw this most probably most notably with Roman Bravo Young and the wrestling team. He wanted to come back for his la for another year because he had it. I gotta I gotta find ways to pay for it because my parents don't, you know, and he's from out of state, so it's a lot of money to go to Penn State. He was able to secure a, no a number of deals that enabled him to come back, win another national championship, both individually as a team hopefully, but even with women's volleyball, one of the women's, women's volleyball players who got some NIL money so she could come back for another year because of injuries, she's been forced into action. She's been a vital part of their team and their run to the NCAA tournament and beyond. Um, so it's helped a lot of people in a lot of ways. And just, you know, athletically is one thing, but some of those people that are coming back are now using taking grad classes. They're, all, they're almost halfway done their, their master's program. And then when they are finished, they're going to have to do six credits or so on their own? I believe it was Gary Gilliam we talked to last week was a triple major. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> like, God. <laughs> and using all, all three degrees. I and can't it, even spell it, triple major. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and using all three degrees in his current, his current form. Did you hear the wrestling team is pretty good at Penn State? Did you hear they're about that? They're, 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 pretty they're pretty good. good. I, I've, I've but you know what's amazing? They're always pretty good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. I've heard that. So, okay, so follow it up. How do, this, how do people get involved if they want to help out student well, athletes? Well, I think the big thing is Penn State's made a very clear coaches, players, everybody, successwithhonor.com is the site. And it's named Success with Honor because that's how we want to do this. And fans can go on there and find a way they can support whatever specific sport they want specific athletes they can request 
companies, businesses that want to get involved can say, hey, I want to do a deal with so-and-so. Uh, how do we get that done? We facilitate it. That the collective handles all the tax implications, all the forms. So even if you're a small business, you know, you don't have to worry about getting your 1099 forms and all that kind of stuff. You can hand that all off and it's all done by us. So it really makes it very easy for everybody, for the athlete and for, and for people that want to get involved. A lot of different ways to get involved. It's definitely a different world when it comes to college athletics and a lot of moving parts. So, And, you know, and Todd, I, I get, a lot of fans don't like it. Yeah. This isn't how it was. But you know what? I don't like it either. But it's the new reality. And you're benefiting student athletes, many of whom are paying their own way to go to school. So there is some nobility in it when you look at what you can do for people whose families have to bear that burden. Look, we always talk about, you know, when you give to, especially during the holidays, that's, that really brings out a lot of giving spirit, um, which you'd like to see all 12 months and that type of deal. But you want to place something in where it's tangible, yep. where you can see where it's, where it's helping. So if someone out there chooses to help student athletes at Penn State, they have that choice. Yep. All right. That wraps up this bonus segment, which we love to do. Keep the fan questions coming, uh, all that type of stuff, other topics you want to hear us talk about, and we'd love to do that. So as we're heading down kind of the home stretch, we still have a whole other month to go on Nittany Game Week. We're going to take you all the way through the Rose Bowl and a little bit past that. So thanks for joining us on this web-exclusive content on NittanyGameWeek.com.